this bitch, Aida's, he even had the nerve to say, you spent too long asking the wrong questions. And this reminded me so much of Zayden. Like, I was just, I literally <laughs> noted it here. Zayden vibes, for real. I'm getting pissed off. <laughs> Damn. Oh. Fuck. Yeah. yeah stop <laughs> emotionally manipulating our main characters. Just let them know shit. Yeah, exactly. Hey guys, Nina here. Hey, I'm Anya. Welcome to our podcast. So today's episode is about the third book of the Crescent City series. Oh my gosh, we all know that we've been waiting for this. Some, I guess, a bit longer than others because me and Anya, we literally just read this book. So we didn't have to wait for years, Mm -hmm. thankfully. Um, And now it's here and we're so excited to talk about it. Yay. And I've already finished the whole thing so I wasn't actually planning on reading it that fast because this book is huge like I was not setting myself a goal of reading 900 pages in a couple of days but it happened (laughs) so now (laughs) I'll be trying to be very careful about spoilers because I feel like I blacked out a little bit while I was reading and even though it's been like a day since I read it I'm like what order is it stuff happening? That, so that's great. That's awesome. But no, I'll try my best. You got this. I have no worries whatsoever. I finished it up until 50%. Literally, like my Kindle says 50%. So basically, cool. we're going to discuss everything up until chapter 46. So spoilers up until then. If you haven't read further, go away and come back later. And yeah, you have been warned. Hey, great. Okay, so... I guess we'll just jump right into it. Oh my gosh, I don't even know how to start. Like the first chapter is basically from Lydia's perspective. Mm -hmm. That was so cool. I loved it so much because, you know, we see Rune's father and Cormac's father in that throne room and they're just being fucking assholes. I hated them. But honestly, like when I read that, I really had the feeling that Rune's father was just pretending. Ooh. I know where Rune is. He deserves to be there. That's what he said. And I don't know. I just had a feeling, you know, like obviously like their dad, he is an asshole. He is a dick. He pretty much tortured his son. But at the same time, you know, he does this research about where the fake come from. He's interested in all of these things. He's super curious. And I just had a feeling that he might not be as loyal to the Asteri that they think, you know. So I just had a feeling that he's just pretending because he wants to show like this face of loyalty. But in reality, he'd want his son to get out of that situation. Right. Yeah, no, I don't have a lot of faith in the Autumn King from the start. I kind of felt like... He has, like, a little bit of a heart or, like, a shred of morality, which means that he doesn't want to see his kids get, like, killed. But that's pretty much it. Other than that, he's pretty much looking towards his own interests and he believes that he's correct, you know? Like, I think he thinks he's doing the right thing and the right thing is just to, like, keep the fey bloodline pure and nothing else comes above that and that's how all of his decisions will be done and whether that means you know being buddies with the Asteri or planning against them that just depends on like what he thinks will keep Faye at the pedestal at the top whatever and so yeah I I didn't have any faith in him to actually give a shit about his children beyond them like fucking procreating and ensuring the bloodline like that's it so yeah i was really satisfied <laughs> with some events in this book i'll say that yeah i like at first i really thought okay there's more to him but then when bryce visited him i mean when she mm-hmm. was taken hostage by him let's say i noticed that yeah it's just about like the fey coming on top it's about their power mm-hmm. like he's just being self-serving that's all he's thinking about he won't do the right thing for the sake of doing the right thing so but yeah i mean there's still a potential for him to become their ally just because you know obviously it's not good the asteri are taking their powers right so that's all i'm gonna say for that 
but we'll yeah. see where it goes. I feel like there's a potential for him becoming their ally, but at the same time, there's also potential for him betraying them. So it's like, you can't, you can't know with this dude. It just literally depends on what he thinks will benefit him and his interests. My face is genuinely red right now, and I am <laughs> keeping my acting skills up, hopefully. <laughs> Because you shouldn't you shouldn't I emphasize that because now I know now I know that something's up here <laughs> something will happen that okay 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 no let's just keep our show further yeah no comment <laughs> exactly that's the right that's the only correct response in this situation <laughs> fuck yeah this episode is gonna be great <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh at the edge of our seats guys um Yay. okay so yeah I love the fact that we got Lydia's perspective I love that. Mm -hmm. I really wanted to get into her head. She's so interesting, damn it. But yeah, like after that whole scene, we then switched to Bryce. And of course, Bryce yeah. traveled to this world. And Reese took her down to the dungeons. And oh my gosh, that was so exciting to read. I was just so happy. I wish you could have seen my face. I was like so excited. What did you think about that whole interaction in the dungeons and all of that? Oh my gosh. I mean, uh, I kind of understood, right, that like if like an alien shows up at your doorstep with a fucking giant sword, you won't be like exactly welcoming or you'll like try to proceed with caution no matter what she mm -hmm. says. So like I get it. I get why she was interrogated and taken hostage and everything but at the same time I was like dude like I know Bryce I know Bryce she's my girl yeah. she won't do anything yeah. bad so leave her the fuck alone maybe yeah. the night court bitches <laughs> so I was like I'm <laughs> annoyed at mm -hmm. all of them and like as we know I've been annoyed with Amran and Raysan since the last Akatar book and I feel like they aren't getting all that much better in this one like, they're still like having like a weird grudge on Nesta and just like being like all not trusting anybody and I'm just like oh god just chill oh my gosh don't you see like you have the prophecy you see that the swords are like like each other so what the fuck like come on it should be obvious I don't know. I know. I know. I didn't like that either. Like, I, I understood, yeah, the initial, like, putting her in a dungeon just to be safe, right? Putting her there and then asking her questions yeah. and stuff. But, yeah, like, Rasan's attitude and Amran's attitude, like, being all badass. I'm like, yeah, yeah, we're the, I don't know, ultimate badass guys here. Like, you should fear us or whatever. And the ways, again, the ways... Sarah, like seriously, she's obsessed with Rissand. Like, who is Rissand based on? Is he based on her husband, who she probably loves dearly? So that's why every time she describes Rissand, he's just this amazing, amazing guy. Because here, again, like the way he was described from Bryce's point of view, this was not a male to be fucked with. None of these people were, but this one, authority rippled off him. And I just rolled my eyes so hard because like, yeah, mm -hmm. we get it. We get it. He's super like dangerous. I mean, and she repeated this so many times that again, I just, mm -hmm. I don't even know at this point if I don't like Rissand or if I just don't like the way Sarah's making up, him up to be this amazing, amazing badass dude. But yeah, anyways, back to the plot. The only thing that I liked from this irrigation scene was, you know, it was fun to see these characters again, even though I, of course, didn't like them in that moment because of Bryce. She was my girl. And the only one that I did like was when Nesta came. You know, she was the only one that didn't seem like a bitch, literally, which is so ironic. Mm -hmm. She was the most relaxed one. She even smiled at Bryce. She was super chill. And I love that. And yeah, we found out certain information here, like Bryce told them about everything that's been going on on her planet. And mm -hmm. we also realized that a tithe, you know, some, which has been mentioned in the Akotar books, that's something that they had to pay to the angels, like as tribute. It was for them. Oh, you know, that's yeah. a tithe. That's something that Tamlin does. You know, when Farah tried to convince him to not do that shit, but he still like taxes or something like that. It actually was you know yeah planted here from with the Asteri so that was such an interesting tidbit 
I didn't know you pronounced this word like that. I only saw it written, so that was like a complete mystery to me how to pronounce it. <laughs> I don't know if it's pronounced correctly. I'm just going, you know, yeah. <laughs> by instinct. I don't know. I, I'd say a tight. Yeah, mm -hmm. A tight. Weird. And also in this world, the Asteri are known as the Daglan. Daglan, Dag Daglan, whatever it's pronounced again. And yeah, th this has <laughs> definitely been mentioned in the Equator series. I know they have discussed certain ancient beings that used to rule their planet mm -hmm. and everything, but I couldn't remember the name, but I know that something was definitely there. And I also like the fact that she had to swallow that little thing so that her tongue could be translated to their tongue because it would be so annoying if Amarin and Rissan had to translate everything for, you know, everyone that I wouldn't like that. So I'm glad she put that little tidbit in there, even if it was, you know. Yeah. yeah. Also, when they were first speaking, they were speaking like old pay language. I mm -hmm. think we learned that like Bryce kind of had to learn it because of her job or in university but it's basically it's not like a language she uses a lot right it would be like mm -hmm. someone learning latin right now i guess right yeah so yeah it got a little bit unrealistic to me that she was able <laughs> to just like hold like conversations and be like her sarcastic yeah. self in like all this fey language so i'm glad that at least after that uh, she got that translation thingy Exactly, like she should have started with like, you know, being a bit awkward with her sentences and maybe like searching <laughs> yeah. for words. And then, for example, Rissan would be like, okay, just give her the thing so that she can speak properly, you know, that would be like, that would be more elegantly put. But yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. And also we found out that these letters that she has inked on her back, the tattoo that Danica gave her, are actually, they are the same as the letters in the book of readings. Which is also a connection that I did not make. Yeah, and like, I guess that's it about the dungeons. Later on, when they leave her alone, she, she teleports actually, she winnows into mm -hmm. that hole down beneath that has like these creatures in it. And, you know, they mm -hmm. all like move apart from her. She kind of knows where she has to go because like this power of hers is kind of leading her the right way. And eventually Nesta and Azriel find her. Well, she initially thinks it's just Nesta. And I really like that. I like the fact that it was Nesta because Nesta at this point is my favorite Akator character. Like she's the, like the best and it makes sense that it was Azriel because i'm assuming i mean this is like sarah basically telling us that Azriel's book is gonna be next like this is pretty much confirmation because mm. in the previous book we got his perspective uh as a you know as a, an extra chapter and here like he was the one that was mostly involved so it will definitely be his book Interesting. Yeah, I was surprised at how little Cassian was even there, because I would assume oh. we'd get, like, Nesta and Cassian together, but then it was all, you know, Asriel. But I love Asriel, so not a problem. Just, like, interesting choice, as you said. Yeah, but yeah it's probably, probably a hint. Yeah. It was a cute moment when Bryce kind of tried to connect with him, and she told him about how her father, you know, burned her brother. Um, of course, like Azriel, he kind of still didn't trust her and everything, so he didn't like really respond. And that's not something that he doesn't do emotions that well. But yeah, Nesta was like, I'm so sorry for your brother. And that was a cute, tender moment. I really liked this bond that I felt like was developing between them. Even like when Bryce, you know, joked around and stuff, Azriel like would sometimes smirk about it and Nesta would always smirk about it, you know. So I really felt the energy. It was nice. But I was just annoyed that it was just the three of them like seriously we didn't get any other members of the night court it was literally all just nesta kim and her and Azriel, and they were like all the time in those tunnels like those tunnels dragged on forever i at that point i just i thought bryce's story was gonna be the most interesting in this book right but honestly i preferred reading about flynn and declan and that gang and hunt you know, and Baxi and, and Room being trapped in the dungeons by the Asteri. So that was so disappointing to me. Well, I won't say that I called it, but I totally fucking called it. I fucking knew that <laughs> you did. we'll just, you know, see a quick glance of everyone and then Bryce will be like, bye, peace out, and that's it. And well, it was more than a couple of chapters, which is what I predicted, but... It was only more than a couple of chapters because the fucking 
story kept fucking dragging on for no reason. Like, the capes were just endless. Like, yeah, what was the point? It just, like, kept, you know, repeating the same thing, basically. Bryce being like, oh, I can't trust the Fae. Oh, they betray me. I better betray them first. Or then, oh, no, actually, I actually like those two. Like, they're pretty cool. No, I can't trust them. And same from their point of view. So it was just like... Why was it necessary to drag it on for so long? I didn't get it. It was a bit annoying, but also I kind of had my expectations pretty low. (laughs) So I kind of wasn't that surprised. But yeah, you're right in that Sarah just loves to like repeat shit. Like, sure, we got this description of Risan that's like, he's incredible. We've also had like three million descriptions of Bryce being the most beautiful woman on the planet or mo- multiple planets. I don't even know. And then that's what annoyed me about the start of the book. By the way, I like this book. I'm just like going in to things that annoy me. I'm sorry. No, it's fine. <laughs> it like, was... let's get rid of that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, like in the beginning, it was so annoying to me that I just felt like I kept reading the same sentences over and over again. Like, Bryce in that cave, oh, I can't trust anyone. Ethan's like, oh, I'm a loser. I can't, like, fucking save this fucking werewolf. Tarion, oh, I'm also a loser. And I can't, like, I can't, I don't know what to do. And it's, it's just the same fucking sentences. Yeah. Over and over. It was like, very I got repetitive. it. Yeah, I don't know. Did anyone edit this book? Like someone had to like sit down and like just like, cross out shit that's been already like said, and the book would have been like two hundred pages shorter and better. But okay. Yeah, I don't know. I think it was very repetitive too at the beginning. Like especially also Hunt. Like he would always repeat how it's everything's his fault and stuff. Yes. You know, that was just mm-hmm. it was too much from everyone for sure. Uh, but yeah, if we focus a bit on the caves again, I was really scared that when they would arrive to the point where Bryce was supposed to go, meaning to that door, you know, when they noticed the big metal door and there was like her star, like the one she has on mm-hmm. her back was there, not on, I mean on her chest. And I just thought, oh my gosh, if she walks through that gate, does that mean that she's going to end up in hell and this is going to be it and Anya's prediction is going to come true? So I was really excited to see that she actually ended up in the prison with Azriel and Nesta. They were together. So I was like, okay, good. Like she's still not leaving the night court amazing and you know my hopes at this point were still really up for like her you know eventually leaving the cave system and going upstairs with them and meeting the gang and talking to everyone I really enjoyed the conversation she had with Nesta about the phone you know about how it Mm -hmm. works and Nesta was like how I mean it's weird that you can't cook with it and you know Bryce was like of course like eventually we're probably gonna able to do that too and Nesta was so excited about the music that it has and you know I really hope that she could record the music that Bryce has on her phone and use it like because poor Nesta she doesn't even have that much music like seriously and she's in love with music and dancing so that was so sad and I thought maybe they would bond over the fact that they're both dancers you know I just needed more time with them all and the saddest thing is that it could have been managed because we got a lot of chapters with them we just needed the tunnel parts to be shortened and she could have gone upstairs and they could have bonded and then somehow they would agree to let her go back to her planet because i guess they'd come to a point where they would trust her to not like you know destroy them right but no like we just had to get like this this distrustful relationship between them and like literally the way they parted was awful because nesta literally told her that she's um, the worst pretty much asriel looked at her like he hated her you know it was just so Mm -hmm. sad because i really thought that we were on the path of this becoming a really cute friendship between the three you know so disappointing like i'm really disappointed by the storyline i like the book and i like the rest of the other things but this storyline particular just Oh, I, I expected too much. I really expected too much. I just thought that the worlds would literally collide, you know, and that it would be a, a much bigger thing than it was. Yeah, I get it. I get you. Uh, of course, I think maybe because the wait was so long, everyone's expectations were like super high. And all the fans had all these ideas about how obviously everyone would be besties if they meet because I love all of those characters. So obviously they would all love each exactly, other. Exactly, yeah. 
you know so that's exactly what everyone wanted to happen but then yeah i kind of expected it because I don't even know why I expected it to happen. Maybe my expectations are just low for it, <laughs> for this book series. I don't know, but um, it's better sometimes to keep your expectations low so that you don't get like super disappointed with things that go sure. your way. And for sure. Yeah, I kind of, I kind of got why they wouldn't trust Bryce immediately. I mean, obviously, she just showed up from a whole different world. And how can you trust her completely? But at the same time, they have, like, Veritas, and Bryce can read minds. But then, also, also, Bryce also didn't trust them, because she has this, like, hatred of the Fae. So, yeah, actually, if you think, really think through those characters, it makes sense that they don't, like, immediately, like... I don't know, start to work together and like go through like a montage of like, training or whatever. So I kind of see it, but then I would have liked it to be shortened a little bit because yeah, like the caves just dragged on. Like it could have either been a couple of chapters and not the first like 20% of the book, or then, yeah, understandable that you don't trust each other, but. Maybe something happens to make them understand that, no, like, we're on the same page, and then they work together, and then it's, like, a bigger part of the book. But, like, here it was, like, weird. It just, like, dragged on for no reason. And also, you mentioned that about the phone and about the music. I actually wanted to say that I straight up, while I was reading A Court of Silver Flames, I didn't know shit about Crescent City, by the way. Like, I just knew that the worlds will be colliding at some point. That's it. So I have, like, a note in the book written down that basically says, imagine having to survive with just, like, little bands and taverns and, like, the church music. And that's yeah, it. Oh like, bitch, <laughs> Nesta, I wish I could buy you a Spotify subscription and play you Charlie XCX. <laughs> Uh -huh. I literally have that written down. Uh -huh. So it was so funny that it actually came up in this book. <laughs> and I was like freaking right that Nesta would enjoy the fact that we have like a bunch of music on our phones. And like, yeah, I just love it. I wish she I love that. could like, oh my gosh, imagine how cute it would be if Bryce like left her phone to Nesta to like, oh, they, they fucking need batteries. Okay. But still, it would be cute. <laughs> It would happen. be so cute. Yeah, like that's how I imagined it. I really thought they were gonna bond and that she's eventually gonna like re-record the songs or just leave the phone for her. I thought, you know, she was gonna show Reese the picture of Rune and Reese would be like, oh my gosh, that's literally my twin and it would be super funny. <laughs> You know, I just imagined all of these like cute little moments and her meeting Nick's and like just bonding with them. And, you know, like you said, this behavior of not trusting each other does make sense to a certain extent, you know, like at the beginning and stuff. But like you said, you know, Israel has truth teller. Reese can read minds. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's true that he did ask her like if, you know, she gives him permission, but she didn't. But like maybe eventually she would. I don't know. It just... It all seemed very convenient. And then, like, eventually, Nesta also told her that she used to be a human. So Bryce mm -hmm. basically knew at that point that Nesta isn't a typical Fae. And, like, you could see it from her behavior. You could see that she's different. She's not like the Fae she knew, you know? And mm -hmm. I don't know. It just made sense to a certain extent. It didn't have to be dragged on for so long. I just really thought that they would come to a place of like understanding each other and just trusting each other or something but yeah that sh sadly didn't happen i was so disappointed by the way they parted um it was devastating and also the fact that bryce freed fucking the asteri that was locked in there i was so mad yeah. oh my gosh i was just like girl you have the upper hand like you want answers and she's locked in there you can literally just say like, I won't let you out unless you give me answers. Yeah, she has no choice. You have a choice, right? You are in the like position of bargaining here, right? So mm -hmm. it was just, oh my gosh, so uh, annoying. And I mean, at least she ended up dying. At least like it worked out for the best because I really thought that now this Asteri is gonna like end up being loose in this world and the next Akotar book is gonna be about that shit. <laughs> so I was just super happy <laughs> to like, get that over and done with right yeah in that moment i totally wasn't 
um, judging Asriel or Nesta for being that and that true with Bryce because yeah, they, like, she really just like does shit and doesn't really think like in this specific instance she didn't really think or I guess to wish to save the world like, overrode everything so that was a bit yeah I also didn't get why it was it necessary to free her from that coffin like it was just what the fuck but also i am interested to find out what's happening with the prison now because we found out like it was actually like a really nice place before but because of this hysteria being trapped there like the match turned bad and now everything is shit like all those horrible creatures are trapped in there imprisoned and now that bryce killed the asteri and fucking redecorated the whole place like not redecorate but you, you get what i mean like yeah. are all the creatures like freed now is the land fine now like what's going on like i want to know because i mean we left so it has to you know be explained in the actor book i guess but the next one why would why would the creatures be freed because Bryce was with her mind like restructuring the mountain, right? Because it used to be a palace before it was a prison. Uh-huh. And so she was like defending herself from Nesta and Azrael, I think, and she like moving shit around, like opening up chambers that were closed before and all of that. Huh. So, like, I want to know what it looks like now. I mean, I understood that just that she was like redecorating in that specific place where they were in, by, uh, in a way to defend okay. herself. You know, I didn't think it had anything to do with the rest of the prison because I assume this is like a really mm-hmm. big place. So, I don't know. Mm-hmm. We'll see, I guess. Yeah, if, it's, if it ends up being a problem. I mean, it would be interesting, I think. Yeah. Um. So yeah, that was like the part where I understood Nesta and Azriel. Like in that part, it was <laughs> Bryce. She was being a total dick. Um. But yeah, like I was annoyed again. Then Nesta and Azriel. I don't know when this happened exactly, but told her that she has to come with them, and they pretty much told her that she can't return to her planet. And she was like, "Well, what? So my planet should just what suffer and die?" And they were like, "Well, yeah, if that's it, if that's what it takes to protect ours." And I was like, this doesn't, like, this doesn't, isn't how these characters that we've got to know in the Akutar series work. Like, that's not how they think. They wouldn't let innocent people die, no matter which planet they're on. It doesn't make sense with their characters that they would say that. I don't know which one said it. I think it was Nesta, but Nesta's not like that either. So that really pissed pissed me the fuck off, you know? Like, Jesus, it was just too much, too much, too much. Oh. Yeah, I don't remember exactly that part, but definitely, if you think about it, the Night Court was always about saving everyone, right? Even like under the mountain, in the war with what's his face, like the fucking evil dude guy. They were like, I guess, trying to save everybody. So I don't know why right now they're so like hostile. Maybe, maybe I mean, they're the trying way- to keep the peace, right? So they don't want a repeat of any wars. Maybe that's how they see it, but still. I don't know. I mean, the way Sarah like described his characters in Akatar was literally like like they're holier than Tao. You know, they're the heroes. They like mm-hmm. are the ultimate heroes. They can do no wrong. So now this shit was just wrong. So it pissed me off. <laughs> but yeah, okay, let's move on a little bit from this storyline and let's skip to Hunt, Tien, and Rune. So they're pretty Mm -hmm. much trapped in the dungeons in the Asteri Palace. They're being tortured. I mean, that was just awful. Like, Hunt was really blaming himself and all of that, which became a bit annoying at times when we mentioned it before. There was a point in the storyline where Baxian had to freaking bite Rune's hand off. So that was incredible and insane. And I was just so sad for them because literally when that happened and when they kind of had a feeling like maybe there's actually a chance of them escaping, Rigolas walked in. So that was Mm -hmm. so annoying because then like him biting his hand off was literally for nothing. If they at least kind of made it to the steps, you know, if they at least like unchained themselves, so they at least achieved something. But no, it was literally for nothing. So that was super sad for them. But yeah, it was a sad situation. Those chapters, I had like actual trouble reading them because they were so so fucked up and so graphic. I mean, she did a great job at 
portraying that, but like it was actually such a huge whiplash from Bryce chilling in a cave to fucking Baxian biting Rune's head off. Hand off. <laughs> like it was. Yeah. <gasps> that part was. Even, I was like laughing at that part, not because it's funny. But because it's so, f- like everything is so messed up that like I just don't know how to react to like one dude biting another dude's hand off. <laughs> like what the I fuck? Know, yeah. So you know, <sighs> oh my gosh. So that was just a great job because I was completely like feeling for these characters as you know those chapters were progressing, and yeah, I was just waiting for the moment where they finally get freed. I obviously expected them to get freed and to escape before, you know, Regulus actually, like, does anything. True. And at least, like, they were together. I mean, not that that's a big consolation Mm -hmm. because they had to watch each other suffer. But at the same time, you know, they were in it together. They were there for each other. So at least they had that. And yeah, it was also really annoying because you then got, you know, the perspective of Ethan and Declan and that gang. And... It was just so sad because they literally had no idea what's going on with them. They have no idea where Bryce went, if she's even alive. They don't know what's going on with them. They don't know how to save them. It's so frustrating. Like, I can't imagine that situation. And Flynn, like, he was really on edge in those initial scenes. And I completely understood the guy. Like, Rune is basically his brother. And he can't do shit to, like, help him. It was so awful to see how upset they were, and they were also dealing with C- Sigrid, right? That's her name, the lost mm-hmm. uh, Fender heir. So she was she was definitely a character. I kind of was annoyed by her at times because she seemed a bit unreasonable. You know, the way she was like, yeah, I want to go with you everywhere and stuff. Like, bitch, Sabina's on the hunt. You know what I mean? You have <laughs> to lay low. It just makes logical sense, you know? It's not about trapping you in a house and not letting you you have your freedom it's about your safety and not just your safety but the safety of everyone since you're supposed to be an alpha like it's about the people it's about the bigger picture so i don't know i mean she was cool and all but i wasn't that into her i wasn't that invested into her that it annoyed me a bit her behavior yeah i expected a lot actually from this storyline like i didn't have huge hopes for some reason for the crossover but I thought that this subplot about the last alpha would be so fucking cool and so fucking interesting and I really you know wanted to meet her I wanted to see what she's actually like see her progress like I was sure that you know this is what will happen she'll become the alpha she'll kick Sabine's ass happy ever after so you know that storyline went into places that were interesting and not what I expected and I don't know I didn't like it I don't see what was even the point of that storyline I mean you haven't finished the whole book but I don't think it's a big spoiler to say that things could have gone on the way that they did without her even being in the picture I don't think a lot would have changed if she just wasn't a character so It was just for no reason, basically. She was there. I mean, up until this point, all I can say is that I agree. Yeah, like, there was no (laughs) point. She just complained and they kind of had, like, this bickering situation. And you could see, like, in Ethan that he's hoping that she will unite the wolves and everything. But, you know, at one point when he met with Jessaba, you know, when he went to her after he ended up killing Sigrid, you know, Jessaba, like hinted to him something among the lines that he doesn't need this alpha like he is the alpha like he could be the alpha so i think maybe like this is where ethan's storyline is going that maybe he will end up being the alpha and maybe this is just like his journey of self-discovering and of understanding that you know he doesn't need anyone else he can step up his game or something i don't know um but we'll see i don't know Mm -hmm. like for now that's like where my train of thought is going that maybe this is like his storyline but future Mm storyline you know what i was like shocked by and i was so happy about when flynn shot sabine in the head i was just screaming and i thought she died i was like oh my gosh she literally killed this bitch i loved it and then they're like no she's gonna heal and i'm oh my gosh for real but no like it was so good like i have it highlighted here but flynn had blasted sabine's face clean off 
<laughs> and then Flynn Fuck was just yeah. like, hurry, hurry, let's just go. And by the way, Flynn is, I think, from this gang, like, he's my favorite. I really wish we had his point of view, too. He's so good. He has this charisma about him. Oh, I love Flynn. He's like, I'm in love with him. So, yeah. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> He'd be mine. He'd be yeah. mine. Out of all of these songs, they all, like, already have mates and I don't know what. But Flynn's still single and ready to mingle. So, I'd be like, hey, Flynn. Okay, there you go. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> oh, I love it. <laughs> mm-hmm. But yeah, like I also didn't enjoy Tarion's point of view that much because he just kind of was so negative all the time. Like it was just too much. He blamed himself for everything. And I was so shocked that like no one knew that Cormac was dead, by the way. When they visited Tarion, that's when he told them. And I'm like, mm-hmm. I mean, I know that he's supposed to be trapped with the River Queen, but like he couldn't get that message across somehow. I don't know. Like with an otter i don't know like just with something to, to let them know that cormac's literally like not alive anymore you know that's so sad that no one knew of, out of all of them oh definitely i mean i think that's an issue with writing a book that has instant messaging and also teleportation right where yeah you need to have those miscommunications and those intense moments and like will they like make it will they find out but then bitch those characters can teleport these characters have texts yeah texts can be intercepted and all of that but bitch, if we have apps that can't be tracked i'm sure in their world they have also invited apps that can't be tracked because they're basically on the same level as we are so the fuck why don't yeah, they plus text more if, you know if he just texted Cormac's dad that's not like really a message that you know he should hide you know what I mean that's that's not a secret it's not like that big of a deal just like Cormac's dad you know and that's it mm-hmm. so yeah I know I agree but yeah after they shot Sabine and everything they basically hid with the Viper Queen with Therian and yeah Ethan eventually he kind of went to the Viper Queen and he made a deal with her for their freedom in exchange like for one fight with him and again like man you should tell her like on that spot you should ask her like who will I be fighting like I need an exact name like it's not that hard right so of course I knew there was gonna be like a trick there and yeah it was it was secret he had to find her and he ended up killing her yep and once again I was like okay but she's not really dead right again what is it with fenders and me just like not accepting that they're actually (laughs) getting killed you know yeah but yeah yeah, but it was such like a out of left field kind of storyline that just i didn't really like it basically if we decide that ethan's storyline in this book is to like accept himself and accept his power and that he could be basically at a high position in the werewolf society or something that could have all happened without Sigrid being there. He could have just like hung out with Declan and Flynn and maybe saved them from something or like become a leader in that position. And we could have hung out with those characters we already know more. And exactly. We could have gone on like this journey of self discovery, but then to like introduce this character, give us like high hopes for her, and then just like, oh no, whoopsie she's dead now and i'm just like what the fuck like what was the point of her like we already have to learn like thirty thousand names in those books so then we don't have as much room for other characters developing if there's like a bunch of storylines that could have been taken out without much content changing so well said. it just felt yeah it, exactly like that kind of annoyed me that there's so many characters that then you don't get as good of character growth, character storylines as you could have. Even in a book with 900 pages, it still felt like there's just like unfinished threads or characters that could have gotten more screen time. So it's just weird. But yeah. Also, yeah, Viper Queen, we don't like her. I don't like her. Like, what the fuck? She's just causing emotional trauma to everyone and enjoying it. And that's her whole point. Was, that's your whole point. Yeah. yeah. I was interested uh-huh. by her character initially, but now I'm just like, she's just there and she's being, she's mean. Yeah. Who cares? Like, nothing is there more than that. 
Oh, so yeah, exactly. this whole storyline with Sigrid and this whole situation also frustrated me. And then the fact that he couldn't even like go with the gang to rescue, you know, Hunt. Yeah. I mean, seriously, that was just so. Oh, they're up back, you know. And then he had to go mm-hmm. back and do I don't know what because he felt like guilty about Sigrid. Like I understand him feeling guilty. Like I get it. This was very hard for Ethan. You know, he tried so hard to save this girl, and then he didn't even want to kill her, but. It was an accident, yeah. pretty much. And honestly, like, if he hadn't, she would have killed him. She was ready to do that. So, mm-hmm. and, like, I did like that one moment when in the fight, you know, before she attacked him again, she did say, you know, I never got to thank you. Because I felt like she was being honest. I don't think she just tried to trick him into... What do you think? She tried to trick him to look away so that she could attack? Yeah, I think it was a trick, oh. honestly. You really do? I don't think. I think she actually meant it. But yeah, of course, she then took it to her advantage when he... I mean, maybe I'm being naive here. Yeah, but like, I don't know. I just want to believe that she meant it. Maybe, yeah. But of all the moments to say it during a very strategic part of a fight, right? Not while they're just like bonding and hanging out and like... Come on, You're girl. Right. <laughs> You're totally yeah. right. She definitely was a bitch. She was a bitch. See? Like, yeah. no. Ugh, whatever. So, yeah, what's more to say, like, here, I guess? Oh, my gosh. How could I forget? When they were stuck in that room, Lydia came. Oh, that was so good. I love that moment. I love Lydia so much. All I want to read about is Lydia. Like, all I want is Lydia in my life. But no, for real, she's so cool. She kind of had to plan things, what she'll do to rescue Rune and the rest. So she kind of had this idea to work with the Sprite Queen. I forgot her name. So she basically like tested her to see if she's like loyal, what her, you know, morals are. And yeah, then she came to the gang and she told them pretty much who she was. That was such mm-hmm. a good moment. And it was so hilarious because everyone was just like, what the fuck? And Flynn was literally like, why do I have feeling I'm like on a really bad acid trip right now? And then because Therian, <laughs> who was still kind of drugged, and he was like, I literally am right now. So yeah. it was so shocking. And like Flynn, he was just so aggressive towards her. He just could not understand. He couldn't believe it. But Declan, being the genius that he is and very rational, he was like, it just makes sense, Flynn. Like she's she's Mm -hmm. they write so yeah that was so cool i love that yeah thank god i was just wanting for rune and hunt and baxian to be rescued already at this point like i couldn't stand it anymore than being trapped in there so i was like yes Lydia, go make your fucking plans you get through in their heads that they can trust you like let's let's go let's go Time's running out. (laughs) Exactly, exactly. (laughs) Oh my gosh. It was great that they actually followed her. God, like if... Oh my gosh, I'd be Mm -hmm. so mad if they didn't. So, um, okay, let's go back to Hunt and the rest. Hunt, like while he was being, you know, tortured, he also saw the shadows and it turned out that it was the Prince of Hell, Apollyon, and his brother Aidas. And they were both, again, very cryptic about his dad. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, spit it out or shut the fuck up. You know, like, just let us know or just, I don't care. Like, really, seriously, how many times have they brought his heritage, like, up and never, like, finished the thought? And I I think, Mm -hmm. I believe I just said something along the lines, this is not the right time to tell you or something. And I'm like, oh my God, then why bring it up at all? Just shut up. Shut up. Exactly. (laughs) They're such drama queens. Like, I don't get it. (laughs) Supposedly, they're, you know, saviors that aren't giving up on Midgard, that are just doing all they can to rid the entire galaxy of those hysteric fuckers. This is their main motivation. But then they're like, yeah, if I let you know this vital information, it'll help you destroy those fucking bad guys. But I'll be dramatic and I won't do it. And I'll leave you guessing some more for plot reasons. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> I mean, we already, like, like no. Sarah's mentioned this multiple times already. We already know there's more to Hunt's heritage, that it has something to do with hell. Mm-hmm. It literally didn't have to be mentioned again, honestly. It was mentioned there to piss us off. Like, that's literally all it achieved. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. And, like, it, this bitch, Aidas, he even had the nerve to say, you spent too long asking the wrong questions. And here, in this moment, this reminded me so much of Zayden. Like, Iron Flame readers, if you know, you know. Like, 
I was just, I literally <laughs> noted it here, Zayden vibes, for real. I'm getting pissed off. <laughs> Damn. Oh, fuck. Yeah. yeah stop <laughs> emotionally manipulating <laughs> our main characters. Just let them know shit. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so yeah, like, if we again focus a little bit on Bryce. So, Bryce, at one point, she asked, like, if Rissand is, you know, their king, right? And Nesta was like, he'd like to be. <laughs> I love that so much because <laughs> Nesta really doesn't like Rissan still. Like, even still, it seems that she's kind of, you know, on edge around him. Mm-hmm. So I love that little tidbit. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, let's just get this over with. Is there anything else that we should mention about this plot line? Like, with Nesta and Azriel and Bryce? I mean, we literally skipped the entire point of why this plot line even happened, like the entire fucking backstory of the Fae and Thea and her sisters and all this shit. I mean, we're just like, who cares about that plot? (laughs) Honestly, I didn't. I didn't really care that much. Like, I don't know. None of this shit that we learned was that new. Like, we already knew this, pretty much all of it. I mean, like, okay, yeah, we found out that Thea actually wasn't that good of a person i suppose so that was yeah. i guess a twist that i didn't really care that much for you know i don't care what Thea was like who cares she's dead she's gone and i mean it's sad for sure that she like destroyed so many lives yeah i mean it literally was an info dump like they had like a fucking powerpoint presentation except it was magical and she just stood up and had a little history lesson and yeah i mean i don't know how else could you release all of that information to us, to the world, but also, isn't it a bit lazy to expose world building and plot twists and everything like this by just having a character monologue for 40 pages? You know, it was a bit anticlimactic, as well as I didn't expect uh, Thea to be such an asshole, so... I guess that was a bit interesting because truly, like, if you asked me, there's no way I would have said that, oh, this character will turn out bad. Like, no way. So, yeah. But then there are so many people involved in that fucking backstory. I'm not sure I get it. There's Thea, Helena, Celine, there's Hell Princess, there's, like, the fucking general guy and everyone's like married to each other or they're lovers or they're not lovers and i'm just like i don't know like i need a fucking someone smarter than me on instagram to draw me like a little diagram (laughs) of the relationships and shit because i was just i don't know it didn't like leave an impression in my brain i don't know how else to say it i mean i guess it makes sense but the way it was presented to us was fucking boring yeah It was too long. It could have been shortened. Uh, Certain things just weren't that, like, important at all. But we basically found out this history. Like, basically, Bryce is obviously... Helen is her ancestor, while Celine is Rissan's ancestor. Mm -hmm. So they're pretty much cousins. And, yeah, Tia, she pretty much betrayed her husband with this general. And then they, like, left this world to become, I don't know, what kind of a gods in the next one. And... Yeah, she was basically a bitch. Then she met Aidas, and I guess she kind of changed her way. She, like, understood way too late that she made a mistake. And there were also humans Mm -hmm. in Midgard. And, of course, we all know how that story went. So, you know, this is what I'm trying to say. Like, we know a lot of this already. Like, we know about the humans. The things that we already know could have been literally just skipped over. Or Bryce could have mentioned them Mm -hmm. just really fast. And, like, then we go to the part that we don't know again. I don't know. I thought we were going to find out, like, something more interesting. Like, maybe how the Asteri are supposed to be defeated. But just like Bryce said, that part exactly was the one that was skipped over. The part that we needed to find out. And, like, then she teleported to her dad and she found that out there. And I'm like, why was this necessary? She could have found that out there and then she could have just immediately gone to hunt. And, like, we could have get... Like, uh, it wasn't necessary. I'm sorry. Yeah, but then the book wouldn't be 900 pages, and you know how important that is, right? Oh my gosh. But as you were talking, I actually noticed that the way I feel about this scene is so similar to how I feel about the scene with Feyre and Rice being stuck in that cabin and 
Feyre accepting him as a mate, basically. Right. Because Rice, he was just monologuing about everything that he ever did and about how all the scenes were actually like from his point of view and what he was thinking when he met her and what that hint meant and what that hint meant and look at how smart I am with writing like if you didn't get it by yourself now I will really spell it out for you because you need to know how smart I am at putting all of those hints in the previous books and that's how I felt about this one too like we're not stupid (laughs) you know like actually i am because i didn't even realize that we found out that there was a fourth thing in in the dead trove and you know if i took like three seconds to think about it i would be like oh this is the horn but i didn't so okay yeah some things were surprising but the things that we definitely 100 percent know we didn't need like another like yep i set that up aren't i smart you know it felt kind of like that and yeah it was a bit too long. <laughs> I get, I see your point now about Rissan's monologue. I mean, I understood your point before, but now I understand it even better because, yeah, that's how I felt about this. And also about the horn, I actually wasn't that surprised about it. I think I suspected it already. I'm not sure if I mentioned it in the previous episode, but yeah, the horn also wasn't like, I actually glossed over that. It felt like I already knew it, even though it was supposed to be mm. new information. So even that wasn't that surprising. And like, even the Asteri that was trapped down there, that wasn't, I mean, yeah, sure that she was still there. But, like, Bryce also needed time to figure out who this woman was. I'm like, it's obvious. Like, that's literally the Asteri that ruled their planet before. And, like, she also took her time to realize that. And I'm like, bitch, you just watched a freaking slideshow about this shit. Like, how can you not realize it's her? You know, I'm like, duh. So, uh, I'm sorry. I feel like I'm really dissing this right now. I like the book, guys. I enjoy it. But, I don't know. I guess my expectations were a bit too high. So, that's why... And it's not just about expectations being too high. Like, point being, all of this could have been shortened or, you know, replaced by Bryce getting to know the gang from the night court and getting along with them and Mm -hmm. getting, like, to trust them. And then, like, if they got to trust her, like, she didn't have to steal the sword. It would be a more interesting story if they would give her the sword because they realized that she really needs it to save her people. And they would come to the understanding that, yes, they need to trust her and help her out because... Like, if she destroys the Asteri, that means that the Asteri won't be able to come into their world anyways, right? So it's a win-win at the end of the day if they just, like, sit down and talk it over. And yeah, this info dumping, yes, I agree with you entirely. There was also a moment where Bryce betrayed, in a way, Nesta and Azriel with the worm. But I understood her mm-hmm. reasoning. She saw that they were, like, powerful warriors. She was like, okay, they're gonna defeat that stupid worm. It doesn't really matter. Yeah, that was also, like, again, unnecessary. Because at the end of the day, she just had to go back. And she helped them anyway. So it was, again, Mm -hmm. just something that was dragged on. And yeah, then we saw Nesta putting the mask on. And, like, we already saw that. We saw Nesta put the mask on in Akotar. We didn't need to see this again from Bryce's perspective. Like, show me something new. Like, give me something new. Like, Bryce hanging out with the Night Court. Yeah, sorry, I'm ranting. Okay, yeah, I mean, I from the beginning didn't expect Bryce to really be besties with the Night Guard. I know. But even with me not expecting it, I still don't feel like this storyline was done all that great. Because it just didn't need to be that long for me. Like, yeah, I kind of expected them to not get... I feel like I'm just repeating myself, but then... I know, yeah. Why drag it on for so long? Yeah. Like, no matter how you spin it, like, yeah, either it didn't have to be dragged on that long or, you know, we Mm -hmm. could have gotten more content that was new and interesting, you know? Mm -hmm. Definitely. But kind of cool that the worm returned (laughs) from the first book, (laughs) you know? That's true. One thing that wasn't on my bingo card is that the fucking worm will return of all the actor characters. That's the one. That's true. That that is kind of funny, yeah. (laughs) And it was actually called like the Mid-Guardian Worm or something. So I guess that's why it was brought back. Mm -hmm. And yeah, in regards to Nesta and Asriel, when they finally saw that she has like more abilities than they thought, There's like this quote, she says that she could see on Nesta's face something like respect too. And I like commented here like, is like, is power the only thing that matters in this world? Like you have to show that you have big powers, that you have big abilities. And that's the only time that they show respect and awe. That's the only time that you can see respect on a person's face. And I'm like, well, can they show respect just because you seem like a really cool chick? Like, isn't that (laughs) enough? And like... 
this is something well. that we've discussed like in the previous episode that it feels like Sarah she's talking about humans being terrorized and I don't know what but then she doesn't give us like one single perspective from a human who isn't that powerful like we get just these powerful beings and then again every time like there's an ounce of respect that Bryce gains from someone is because of her abilities and I'm like what's the message mm-hmm. here it gets annoying you know so I was just like well I don't care about her powers. I just like her for her, you know? Yeah, yeah. But then you kind of get why Bryce is annoyed at the Fae just as a whole species. True. Like, I don't think it's right that she just, like, hates everyone for just being born Fae. But then mm-hmm. basically all the Fae she meets are assholes. Even, like, in the Night Court. Yeah. Like, come on. I can't, like, be too judgy of her not trusting them as much as she should have, I guess. True, true. Because of her experiences. Yeah, that's true. And Mm -hmm. you know what I really liked in their interactions? Every time Asriel held her hand. For some reason, I really liked that. Like, he took Bryce's hand in his broad, calloused one, pulling her towards the chamber beyond. And I literally commented here, it's so cute when he holds her hand. It's so adorable and protective. (laughs) I really like this idea. Like, at this point, again, I like this idea of them becoming friends. So the way he grabbed her hand, like, being all protective, alpha hole, I really ship that. And also, like, if Bryce and Hunt weren't a thing, if they weren't mates, I would ship Bryce with Asriel. Like, I would ship this shit. I'm sorry, but I would live for that. So, yeah. But, of course, Hunt is her (laughs) mate and they're cute and everything. But, yeah. (laughs) <laughs> okay so yeah Bryce she basically stole truth teller and she teleported to her world and she teleported on purpose to her father's palace to the autumn king we didn't know at the time that it was on purpose though it was kind of weird that that's the place where she teleported to but yeah you know he put those shackles on her she told him a lot of stuff and anyways her end goal here was to find out like how to defeat the Asteri she knew that her dad like knows a lot of shit And the Autumn King, like, he's so weird because they had, like, that, I mean, not a bonding moment, but they were honest on the staircase. He told her, you know, about her mother. He basically told her that he's jealous of her adoptive dad. He was like, yeah, I'm jealous, whatever. He got your mother. He got to raise you. And then, like, it was kind of tender, like, as tender as it can get with him. And then in the next sentence, he's like, you little bitch. And I'm like, oh my gosh, let's talk about hot and cold, right? But yeah, like Bryce even said it at a point that maybe like this is kind of his defense mechanism. You know, as soon as things get a bit too close and personal, he kind of just becomes aggressive again because I guess he doesn't want to deal with emotions. I mean, Mm -hmm. as much as I don't like him, he is an interesting character. I did hate the interactions between them, but I still thought that maybe like this whole plot line was also a bit unnecessary. She could have discovered the truth about this pocket that is created with the weapons, right? Nothingness or whatever. Mm -hmm. She could have discovered that there. I guess so, yeah. But I did and try seen their interactions also I didn't expect that Bryce orchestrated the whole thing so that was like really cool of her yeah that was cool yeah yeah but yeah he definitely has like some shred of like humanity in him and there's like a tiny part of him that's going oh maybe I should be a good father and then this just like gets destroyed by I don't know the fucked up part of his brain I guess so we'll see like which side wins in the end i guess but yeah i didn't actually expect that bryce is there out of her own free will shall i say so it was so fucking cool for me to see her just like fucking lock him in the fucking closet that was amazing (laughs) get the sword back and she like pooped him on the nose with the sword yeah yeah i was like bitch (laughs) <laughs> I'm in love with you go on <laughs> I loved seeing her make fun of him I love that so much yeah. and he literally could not do shit about it I mean if I were her I'd do the same thing like he was shackled he yeah. couldn't use his powers like <laughs> bye bye grandpa and you know the closet that reminded me kind of of her locking Micah in the bathroom or well yeah. he both did that like they both did that so it was good it was really good and I can only imagine like his face how angry he was and he couldn't <laughs> shit and just like yes i live for this yeah. so yeah that was a really good moment okay yeah now let's go to my favorite part of the book at least so far oh when rune hunt and vaccine got rescued by the hind the hind i don't know if that's pronounced but oh my gosh that was so amazing because they were literally like put in an elevator and she literally blew the hog's brains out yeah. and everyone was just like 
Yeah. What the fuck? And I mean, Baxter's response, he was just, what the fuck? <laughs> he didn't know shit, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, Rune, he wasn't even there. He was literally so, so weak. So he didn't even understand mm-hmm. what was going on. But Hunt, yeah, he suspected mm-hmm. it. While Baxter, he just couldn't believe shit. And yeah, the way she said, like, we have a minute to do this, to do that. I'm like, yes, fucking it's time you know i've been waiting for this and i mean back scene he was at the back of the jeep and he was shooting everyone and i could just envision that in my head you know them in that jeep like just running everyone over guns blazing here and there angels in the sky you know flying after them then that freaking big enormous explosion from the queen right i was like this is amazing and the fact that the sprite queen did it you know it was symbolic because they had a role in the rebellion in the past as well and it was just symbolic especially for hunt so really that was her vengeance in a sense and i really love that for her that lydia gave her this opportunity she didn't just use her to her own advantage she like also gave her that you know in a way yeah. um it was so it was so good everything about this was so good oh fuck yeah I could imagine it in my head as a movie. It was such a good action sequence when they were driving in that Jeep and like the doors to the city were closing and they were just like barely making it and the gun got, you know, torn off. Yeah. And I was like, I can't imagine this in like a Hollywood production movie yes. in my head. Like it was so good. So yes. when the action is done well, it's done so well. I was so happy with that whole scene. Yeah. Yeah, she does action really well, I agree. And, you Mm -hmm. know, when she turned into the animal and she kind of nudged, you know, Rune with her, like, nose and stuff, that was so adorable. I could also see that. But Rune, he wasn't even aware of what was going on. But then, like, yeah, when they went into disguise, that's when he realized and he panicked. And I was really scared for Lydia. I mean, I knew, like, no way they were going to kill her now. Like, what's the point then? You know, Mm -hmm. seriously, if she kills her off too, I would just be, like, so mad. But yeah, she did. I mean, she did pretty much die, which is realistic. Jumping off that cliff, of course, she died. But yeah, she got rescued, thankfully. Tarion got her, and they like used their magic to help her out. Like there was a twist there too. She has twins, so that was wow, interesting. And the way they were described, I can already see they're gonna grow into some handsome, handsome young men. And it was sad for Lydia to see that though, like, she had to abandon them for their own good, but that little one, like, the black-haired guy, like, he was just so mean to her. But again, you can't blame the kid, you know, he he's a kid, right? So, but yeah, it was mm-hmm. heartbreaking to see her, because everything she did, she did for others. She was so selfish. She really did it for the sake of humanity in a way. Ugh. I'm really curious who the father is. I mean, I hope it's not Pollux, but they would probably have wings if it mm-hmm. were Pollux. Yeah, true. I think it's one of my favorite storylines in the book that we could yeah. see this side of Lydia and that this was her backstory. I just so- truly felt her connection with them and how much she loves them and how traumatic and horrible it must have been to leave them and to do than everything in your life basically to protect your kids and you know, and you can't even see them and yeah yeah but you can also get her son because damn like he had to grow up without without ever seeing her so of course you as a kid you won't be immediately like yeah i understand all of your hard difficult adult decisions so i'm not yeah. mad at you like of course not but then also reading it from Lydia's side i'm just like damn it she doesn't deserve that oh yeah so, yeah I love but that at story. least at yeah. least one of the boys was kind of you know understanding a little bit more so at least she got that mm-hmm. at least from him so thankfully, both of them weren't like completely like rude and everything. But the way they were described, I really like them. Like one is the jock, the athlete, and then the mm-hmm. other one is like a genius. It's so cool. I mean, how can you expect any less from her offspring, right? Yes. I like Lydia a lot. I like her a lot. I just hope we get more of her perspective. This is like my hope for the rest of this book, to get more of her perspective and more interactions with her and Rune. Like the little that we got here, I loved it. You know, like literally we got so little and yet like Mm -hmm. we got these like little tender moments, at least from her part. We understand like Rune being a bit angry, but I think now that she saved him, he's over that. But they have to find common ground, of course. And there was like a moment that I really liked. Rune asked her when they met up, he was going to the gym. And of course he was like shirtless and sweaty and sexy. And they met up in the hallway and he asked her about her kids. And 
She snapped at him and said, I wanted you to listen, she snapped, but you wouldn't. Yet now that I fit some sort of acceptably sad female backstory, you're willing to hear me. And I really saw that because like, yeah, if she just said to him, there is no backstory. I just, I was evil and then I changed. Would he be as understanding? But now that she's like this poor mother who had to leave her children behind now he understands because she's this poor female that he has to protect and be there for you know i love rune don't get me wrong i love the guy and he's a really fair and honest dude and i feel like once they patch their things out they're gonna be unstoppable but i understand her point of view here too it really does appear that way yeah even I felt a little bit called out at that moment because in the last episode of this podcast, I was like, not so sure about Lydia, not so sure mm -hmm. about how I felt about where she stands, the evil she's done versus all the good she's done. I felt like I needed a bit more. And then I'm like, oh, she's doing everything for her children. And then she's like, well, fuck you if that's what changed your mind. So, you know, fuck me. <laughs> 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 I get it. I right. get it. I Well, yeah, I'm different. I, I kind of gave her the benefits of the doubt. And so I'm proud mm -hmm. of myself. I, the children aspect just kind of, yeah, softened me a little bit more. But I was soft for her before, too. So I'm just glad we learned more about her. And hopefully we'll learn even more. I mean, eventually when she gets closer to Rune, she'll probably tell him about her story and, you know, about the guy, the father of her kids. And yeah, we'll see. Yeah, I think it was more the fact that we got to see her point of view and we got to see her side of the story so mm -hmm. it's more that yeah finally got to see inside her head rather than what yeah. exactly the backstory is but still yeah i know i know um and mm -hmm. i just want to read just two quotes that i like when lydia was in the elevator and she shot hawk so the way it's written i love it and hunt knew he'd treasure this moment forever the moment when lydia servos pulled out her gun and fired it right between the hawk's eyes I mean, this is described, you know, such a badass moment. And then another one when she had to like plunge into her dad pretty much. Then she bounded off into the trees, a streak of sunlight that was there and gone like she'd never been. I mean, she didn't plunge into her dad here, but it was so sad when he said like she'd never been here. Like my heart was like sinking, you know, I knew no Sarah will not kill her. But you always have that bit of a doubt there in your head. Like mm -hmm. you never know. So, yeah, it was kind mm -hmm. of was creepy. Okay. So Ethan, let's go to him a bit for a second. He stayed behind because he wanted to find the necromancer to help bring Sigurd back mm -hmm. to life. And he went to the House of Shadow and Jezebel was there. By the way, I might dislike that Ethan, you know, didn't go with them. But I do like that we find out more about Jezebel because she's yeah. so interesting. I literally find out that she used to be a priestess. She used to be a human priestess that worked in that library. And, you know, she really mm -hmm. values these books, not because they have, I don't know what kind of a power, but just because of the knowledge that they possess. And I really love the fact that yeah. here, here is like a character that seems super powerful, super badass, but in reality, she doesn't care about power at all. And that was so, so freaking refreshing. And there's like this quote that I have to read. So a world where people loved and valued books and learning so much that they were willing to die for them. I love that because I feel like knowledge, you know, that's what I appreciate about our world. I appreciate that, you know, knowledge, we can get it whenever we want. We can just Google shit. We can go to libraries, you know, read about it. So I understand that she wanted the truth to not stay hidden forever. And the library, she wanted that to be safe. And I love that. I think Ethan asks her about when will she strike against Apollyon or whatever. You know, Apollyon, he basically cursed her because he thought that it wasn't just about knowledge, that it was about power because everyone's obsessed with power. And she pretty much tells him about the curse and she says, to live unchanging until I showed him the true power of the books. And she basically says that she like won't rebel or do anything until she isn't convinced that these books are truly safe at last. So that's her goal. You think, oh my gosh, she has such an agenda. I don't know what she has up her sleeve. But in reality, she's just about these books. That's all she cares for. It's insane. And yeah, Apollyon, he basically cursed her. That's why she has these abilities, these powers. She was never actually even a witch. She kind of joined them because she wasn't human, but she wasn't anything else either. So she was just stuck somewhere in between. 
And after she saw that the witches were going down a bad path, she didn't want to be a part of that. So she deflected and she joined this house and now she's second in command. Insane, right? Like, what a story. I think that we said before that we believe that she doesn't actually turn anyone into animals, that she just wants to <laughs> appear all scary to everyone else. But those are actually just like real animals. So yeah. we were right about it. <laughs> yeah. So we yeah, I was happy to figure out that we were right about that. High five. <laughs> <laughs> you can't see us, but we're doing a virtual high five. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I do really like her, and I think that she has a really cool backstory, and I don't think we got, like, a super total confirmation, but I still believe that Midgard is Earth, and that we're on our planet just in the future, but do you think that the technology and everything was already, like, on our level when Asteri and everyone arrived or not? Because we got a little bit of a flashback right from Jessiba. The way she was describing it, it felt like a little bit more ancient times. Like the city was like walled off and everything. That feels a bit more like, I don't know, like not not current times, I guess. Plus in the current times, we actually have phones and shit. So we wouldn't necessarily need to like protect paper books. But I really expected that we'll find out that the Earth was invaded when it was already the 21st century and the humanity was already advanced. Because we've had so many references to human technology. I mean, the technology was just like called the same things that it's called on our planet, like price mentioned GPS in this book, you know, phones are phones, radios are radios, TVs are TVs. They fucking have, like, sushi, and I don't, like, what I'm saying is that their culture is so similar to today's Earth culture that they really expect to be like, oh, Sara is doing a very clever thing here. Like, the Asteri just came in and, like, stole all the culture from humans and that's why it's all so similar now 15,000 years later they just adopted everything that we already did but no actually I don't think that was the way it was explained or planned so now I think the reason is she just didn't feel like coming up with her own terms for stuff and I really hope that it wasn't laziness. I really hope that it was clever hinting. And now I'm like, it was probably laziness. It was probably easier to make the technology exactly as it is here. And now I'm I'm a bit disappointed. Yeah, I think it's actually like that she just made this up. You know, it's not Earth. It's literally just a planet that's similar to Earth and our technology and stuff. But at the same time, like, I don't know, you know, because when Bryce was with Nesta and Azriel and she like saw these clips of the human civilization, she saw like, I don't even remember how it was described, but the way she was describing it, it seemed advanced. So that's when I felt like, oh my gosh, probably it is Earth, right? Because of the way it was described and also mm -hmm. the constellations that she found, like, I think she mm -hmm. mentioned the fish and she mentioned the archer, right? And that's like, reminds me of, right, yeah. Pisces and Sagittarius. So mm -hmm. it's like our constellations, just the names are different. It's not Earth, it's Midgard. I mean, yeah, I don't know. I'm also confused by this, but... Yeah, they have lighting over there. Yeah, exactly. So mm -hmm. she wants us to wonder, I guess. I don't know. True. Listeners, if you have any opinion about this, let us know. Or if maybe you know something that we don't. Uh, yeah, please let us know. I mean, I'm sure that we're not either not picking up on everything or we might have forgotten some tiny thing. So we always appreciate <laughs> being corrected in the comments. Okay, so yes, we found out a lot about Jessiba and I really like how she opened up to Ethan. Like, literally, Asker mm -hmm. and Jesus told him. And there was, like, also another cute moment when, you know, she said, like, you ask too many questions. Like, just shut up. And he was like, then stop telling me everything. <laughs> and I was just like, again, <laughs> exactly. 
<laughs> like she always just complains and she's just always like you can't like oh, i already gave you enough and then she sends the exact thing that bryce needs and now here again you ask too many questions and yet she answers every questions he asks her so i'm like well jessaba like make up your mind you know <laughs> so yeah funny. And the way she talks about Bryce versus the way she talks to Bryce is also like so funny because to Bryce she's like, "Ooh, get this contract to me, or I'll turn you into a toad." Ooh, ooh, ooh. Yeah. And <laughs> when she talks to anyone else, she's like, "Oh my gosh, my only competent assistant is gone. That's horrible." <laughs> like, you yeah. know, obviously she yeah. loves her. That's so cute. Exactly, <laughs> she loves her. She mm-hmm. loves her. I love her and I hope yeah somehow she gets into with the gang she becomes mm-hmm. more a more constant part of this you know whole situation anyways now that we're talking about Ethan and everything she pretty much says that yeah if he wants the necromancer he has to work for her and she gets him Hypaxia of course Hypaxia literally was pretty much shunned from her kingdom she's not queen anymore mm-hmm. So, yeah, that's kind of intense. But honestly, I'm not that interested in her story at this point. And I mean, Jessica had a point here. Like, Hypaxia, she knew of the threat that this person, this general posed. And she did nothing about it. She knew, you know, and she just let it happen. So I I understood Mm -hmm. Jessica's annoyance at her for not, like, doing more, I guess. Because Mm -hmm. it's like, now her people will suffer because supposedly this general that is in command now is very, very awful, you know? So yeah. yeah. Yeah, I guess yeah, Hypaxia was a bit naive and could have done more. I don't know, she doesn't sound that interesting to me. She's just too too vanilla in a way. So yeah, but I was happy to find out that of course when she found out about Celestina's betrayal, I guess she ended it with her and now she's here in the House of Shadow with Jessica and she just I mean, I literally finished at the part where she had to go do her vows and then she called Ethan down to Sigrid's body. So I guess now they're going to try to okay. Resurre- okay. resurrect okay. the wolf, right? So that's it for this story, right? It concludes here for me for now. And yeah, anyways, Hunt, Bryce, and the gang, they're reunited. It was a cute moment when Bryce kind of teleported to them and she said, and for Bryce, home was and always would be Hunt. And the moment she got there was amazing because they were like literally in a meeting with the Ocean Queen. And she just came stroll in there like a boss. I mean, honestly, like maybe her behavior was a bit excessive for me because I like Bryce. I like her rebellious spirit and stuff. But still, there is a moment in time for certain words. Like she was literally in a meeting with this almighty old as fuck queen and the way she behaved like with the swagger and everything. I normally like it, but in this case, yeah, it was a bit off-putting. I just wanted her to have like this normal adult conversation with her. I mean, if someone talked to me like that, like they walked in and announced themselves queen and like they owned the place while this is actually my ship, I am the host here. You know, show some respect. It was a bit disrespectful to me for some reason. I don't know. I guess this is the international relations major in me that, you know, (laughs) has a bit of a thing for candor, I guess, and for diplomacy, you could say. Um, Mm -hmm. But anyways, I mean, she basically told them all about what she found out. And this queen, she basically doesn't really want to help. She just wants a way out. So, like, if she's able to open the portal to the other world so that they can, like, cross over there and go to safety. Yeah, first of all, uh, let me first add something to the very first thing you said. She returned to Han because that's her home. That instantly reminded me of the ending of the first book, where she texted Connor, I'm home after two oh. years. When she found oh, Han. And that's I'm gonna just... cry again. So it's definitely a parallel, and I love it that this is how she views him from the start guys yeah. like if you haven't listened to our previous episode like that part when she texted connor that she's home that's the saddest scene from these books ever like that's the scene that broke me the most so that's why i'm so upset now Aww. but yeah i'm i'm glad i'm glad you made this parallel anya very cute yeah for me it's bittersweet i would say that because i'm still so happy for bryce and hot even though like on our of course of course, it's tragic, but okay, let's let's move on a bit to, yeah, then that whole scene of Bryce just like walking in and acting like a bad bitch. I mean, sure, I know that you're correct, technically, 
but also Bryce just survived being on a different planet and traveling back from there and then dealing with her asshole dad and like she's probably done with everything like at this point I would be done with everybody's shit like I just saw a different planet and you're telling me that oh like there's some diplomacy to deal with on this one I'm just like come on like I just killed an unkillable being that's more powerful than all of us combined like let's let's get to the point a little bit quicker like i get like of Of course course, of course it's bad to be like that but at the same time i got her and also it was funny and i don't know I like sarcastic characters, so I I I, I, yeah, do too, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> it's just it's just like it's about the seriousness of the situation. Like mm-hmm. I know, mm-hmm. you know, I understand. Sometimes diplomacy and shit it means little when lives are at stake. Of course, like you have to think about mm-hmm. that. But when you think about these lives that are at stake, if you want to actually save them, you have to play by the rules. You know, like you just have to because otherwise you won't achieve shit. And if you don't achieve shit, then what did that sarcasm actually serve you, right? But, like, I like Bryce and everything, but I don't know. Moments like this sometimes make me not like a character. Like, it was the same with Farah. Sometimes I like bad bitch characters, but when you just appear cocky in a way at, like, the most unopportune moments, that just drains the life out of me <laughs> because I also don't like cockiness. But, I mean, Bryce I still like. I'm still not at the point of not liking her. Hopefully mm-hmm. I'll never get to that point. But, yeah, listeners, I'm not that mm-hmm. big of a fan of Farah. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, I wanted to just, like, bring up a concern of mine. When there was, like, a conversation between Bryce and Hunt, they kind of didn't agree on something because, like, Hunt pretty much told her that she didn't have to watch her friends being tortured because, you know, of course, shit went to hell and, like, you shouldn't blame yourself for that. But at the same time, we did stand up for what we believe in and I don't regret that. And then he said that to her. And I'm on Bryce's side here. I feel like you have to stand up. And if you want to change it, if you don't want to live in this world, like you have to risk it, even if that means you'll suffer along the way. So I agree with her, but I also understand his point. But anyways, this was just kind of troubling for me because the way Kant reacted, he got really mad. It said here, his face changed to the Umbra Mortis face. He basically put on the face of the Umbra Mortis. His voice was chilled too, as he said, good thing we both made it then. And I kind of just like highlighted this and said, oh my gosh, this worries me. Like I'm worried that maybe they won't agree on things and they won't be as of a united front that they used to be because of their different experiences. I mean, obviously the way Bryce is thinking and what Bryce's motivations are, that's all good and right and correct. And that's obviously what we should all strive for. But at the same time, Yeah, I couldn't be too mad at Hunt. I mean, okay, I want to make a distinction between how I feel about Hunt and how I feel about Sarah's writing style. Because Mm -hmm. the fact that it just like went on and on and on, like, everything's my fault, everything's my fault. Oh, none of this would have happened if it wasn't for me. Like, that was fucking annoying because, like, we got it. It could have been stated once. It didn't need to be just intersected after each paragraph. And when I'm complaining about characters complaining, this is what I'm complaining about. And not necessarily that I don't believe that they should be feeling those things. Mm -hmm. That's a bit of a distinction because I... I agree. ...do understand that, you know, reliving like all the fucking torture again, that would make you hesitant of you know, knowing that this is, again, a possibility that could happen. And, like, sometimes you, like, know what the right thing is, but your fears or your anxieties take over and you're just, like, stuck and not doing the right thing, even though you know you know what it is. So I couldn't be too mad at Han because I feel like it was just a bit realistic and a bit relatable how he yeah, was acting. Yeah, of course. I don't know. Yeah, Yeah, I agree Mm -hmm. with that. I agree with that. But I'm just saying that I'm more on Bryce's side, like in the sense Mm -hmm. that if I were her, I would think the same way, right? But of course, I understand Hunt for sure. And I also agree about Sarah's writing. I couldn't agree more with this because you know that my complaints in Akotar were exactly this, that the way she writes certain characters, the way she glorifies certain characters and the way she disses other characters just 
it doesn't sit right with me. So it's not necessarily maybe about the characters, but about the way she writes about them that then makes me dislike the characters as a result, in a way. But that's, yeah, mm-hmm. go listen to our Akator episodes, guys. Okay, yeah, I mean, we pretty much discussed everything. I guess now they're gonna go to Avalon, to that king, like, uh, yeah. for Max's dad, to find out the truth. Hopefully that won't drag on for too long. Hopefully it will be well-balanced. So I think this is it for this episode. Um, I think we've discussed everything we wanted to mention, hopefully. And if not, I guess we'll just mention it in part two. But yeah, I'm excited to finish this book. I don't know what's gonna happen. All I know is they're gonna go to the Avalon King now, probably find some answers, take a stand. Like Bryce's dad is probably gonna betray them. And yeah, the only expectation I have at this point is just that we get more of Lydia and Rune. I need these two. They're the most interesting couple for me. I'm so into them. And since we're probably going to have to wait for years for the next book, I really need as much as possible of this relationship. Cool. Great. We shall see if this <laughs> is what happens. That sneaky smile on your face. I don't like it. What's that sneaky smile? It's sneaky. It scares me. Don't look at me like that. <laughs> look away. <laughs> But I mean, that could be good. That could be good because I really like them too. So, I know, you but know. it's making me nervous. It's making me nervous. <laughs> Fuck. No. No, okay. <laughs> no, you know what? I did a pretty good job of not revealing shit. So I'm True. quite happy about that. I mean, if I reveal that there's more scenes of Lydia in Rune, I don't think it's like that much of a spoiler. <laughs> no like, shit. Obviously. No. So, you know, you're welcome <laughs> for that information. <laughs> But yeah, I feel like I sat down right now, plugged my microphone in and just straight up complained for two hours straight about this book. When in reality, like I read this in three days, like the whole thing. And I was enjoying myself the whole time I was doing it. So I don't want to seem like there's like nothing but negativity on my part. For this book because it was very readable even though you know there were some issues that I don't love that still didn't overshadow the fact that it was this fast paced and that interesting and that so many things were happening that I enjoyed yeah yeah same here I like this book a lot I would have already finished this as well if I weren't as busy but I'm enjoying it. I'm having fun. Like a lot is happening. There's always something going on. We have a lot of different perspectives. So yeah, so far so good. But yeah, just like I said before, I did have high expectations for certain things, especially for, you know, the night court being a part of this book. So that was disappointing for sure. And info dumping. Yeah. But other than that, I really enjoy Mm -hmm. it. And I love these characters so much. And I can't wait to you know, see what comes next. I'm kind of sad about finishing it because when we finish it, yeah, that's it, right? I mean, we're going to have to wait for a while to get a new book and that's going to be annoying. Right. So yeah, that's that. Thank you for listening and subscribe, follow us, comment, let us know what you think and light it up. Yeah, and talk to you next week. (laughs) Bye. Bye.